Uh, my name is Kali Okuno. Uh, I'm a member of Cooperation Jackson and the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement. We're at the Common Bound 2016 conference uh, trying to focus on building a new economy and a new world. But I'm dealing with some of the challenges of the present world and the old world and uh, just kind of the new situation that we're, we're finding ourselves in, particularly in the Black Liberation Movement and the, the current kind of upsurge and where that's going, post Dallas, you know, uh, and what happened there just a couple of days ago. I think we're entering a new situation, a new equation, uh, and I'm trying to find center in thinking, you know, putting one foot forward to the future as best possible, but then how do we resolve the issues of the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th, and 20th century? How do we still deal, deal that and, and kind of balance that account? We're in a new moment in that um, you got growing resistance, you know, from the movement for black lives, from labor in different respects, from the, the climate justice movement. I mean, there are a lot of emerging movements which are taking place, kind of gaining ground, gaining momentum. But there's also an, uh, just as equal, if not at this point, quite actually a greater right drift, a reactionary drift. And, uh, and both of this is happening on, on different levels. And I think what we're seeing is that the, the center of American politics and social life is fragmenting and fragmenting rapidly. And that center cannot hold. And all of the little short-term fixes that you know, the, the ruling forces are trying to come up with, they collapse, they're you know, paper thin. Um, but we're not quite clear where this is all headed. Worst case scenario, uh this is this is kind of what I see playing out which is which is terrible. I mean I hate to be a downer, but I see a major ecological calamity within the next 3 to 4 years that I don't think any of us are prepared for. That's going to have massive impact on food yields uh which is going to trigger massive instability greater than what we've already been seeing so you're talking about massive migration from Africa, from Latin America and, and Oceania and, and Asia uh, into northern countries, including the United States, and I see massive military repression to stop that. Since all the nation states at this point are committed to, you know, running off the cliff, basically, you know, uh, with a capitalist-driven, carbon-centered economy, and they're not trying to alter that in any fundamental way. Just, we might reduce a few things here, but that just means a trade-off in the book, fundamentally for them. We're seeing, you know, climate refugees that are already engaged in their societies in massive civil wars, be it Yemen, be it Iraq, be it Syria, be it Libya, you know, be it the Sudan, be it, you know, uh, Nigeria. So that future is here. You know, what we're talking about in the future, it is already present, and we're seeing massive amounts of people struggling, being, you know, dying along the route, trying to get to Europe, trying to get to other parts of Asia, trying to get to, to the United States. People get mad at Trump talking about building a military wall. The reality is we already have one, and it's just increasing, it's just growing. So the response from this side of the equation is just to up, you know, up the ante on that to increase that militarization and we have yet to be able to kind of mount the force to counter that in any substantive way. Present action being an indication of future action, we know that's going to escalate. I think the movement for black lives, quite honestly, is actually a response to Katrina. It's a delayed response to Katrina. You know, we were waiting for it, we were anticipating, we thought it should come along, and then, you know, it took about 10 years, but I think it matured and now it's here as this crisis, calamity, killing, you know, irrational policy leading on, and people just finally getting to the point where they can't take it. I think the move for black lives is that. What happened in, in Dallas, I think, is now changing the equation where protest is not led to the policy shifts and reforms that people thought were possible under an Obama regime. And I think Obama, the failed promise of what people had, so many people had of, about his administration also led to black lives. And I think people are seeing like, where do, when, when that is no longer an option, what else can we do? And there's a crisis, I think, of imagination of what is possible. But then there's, you know, there are, there are millions of folks who understand 
the only way sometimes you can meet violence is with violence. Fundamentally, every human being has a right to defend themselves. And how people defend themselves, I think, is, is determined by them. It's not determined by those who, you know, are putting the boot on their neck. That's, that's number one. I think that's a fundamental principle. Not that I'm endorsing the guy in Dallas at all. But I will say, I, I, I think there are millions of people who understand his rage and his anger and, and uh, may not be in support of the action, but, but won't condemn it because, you know, at, at what point do, you know, people just stop killing black people, the police just stop killing black people. And, and, and if no one is going to hold any of them accountable, you know, what other recourse do some people have? How do you really combat an enemy which is so determined to use violence, which has perfected the use of violence? It's hard when you're, you're inside of this beast, you know, in, in our historic role has always been subject to it without resources with, of, our, of our own, without land, of our own industry, of our own, you know, to be able to use it as a counterweight. Um, thinking and contemplating it as a form of resistance to create some space, uh, I think is legitimate. And I, I don't think people should have some abstract argument that it's not. But can it win? That's another question. Um, uh, can it succeed? And, and will it create the transformation that we want? 20 years from now. I, this is the best case scenario, is we build a substantially larger social and solidarity economy movement in, this, in the United States. We've transformed some major areas in this United States towards localized, you know, production. We've kind of grown and matured to a point where we're, we're coordinating production so it's not wasteful. Uh, we're meeting basic kind of human needs in a very coordinated, you know, planned fashion that's within ecological limits. Uh, and we've transformed enough of this state to be in support of these policies and to be the redirecting the, the massive amount of accumulated resources, you know, of this state and of this, of this land towards extending this type of economy, this type of social development. That is where I see us at in, in 20 years. And I see us with some of the demographic shifts and we're, we're effective with our organizing, being, you know, building a, a solid block of progressive whites, you know, black folks, indigenous folks, to be able to coordinate this and to break the back of the old social order of the settler state, which is premised on maintaining white supremacy and the capitalist social order. I think there are some things that which give us the potential to be able to make that shift, but it's, we're gonna have to be a lot more deliberate and intentional than we are now.